now that we have interpretation into French and Spanish. And please click on the globe icon at the lower part of your Zoom window and select the language of your preference. So my name is Imke Greven and I am a program advisor with Land at Scale with the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, RVO. And I welcome you all to this webinar on inclusive land governance and fit for purpose land administration. Whose purpose? This is a third webinar in a responsible scaling series initiated by the Netherlands Enterprise Agency and the Land Portal Foundation as part of the Land at Scale program. Land at Scale is a Dutch land governance support program financed by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and managed by RVO. Land administration is a powerful tool for equitable development, but its success depends on how it's being implemented. We are here today to discuss how a people-centered approach can transform fit-for-purpose land administration and ensure it truly serves the needs of communities. By prioritizing the voices of local people, especially women, youth, and marginalized groups, we can create land administration systems that are not only efficient, but also just and inclusive. We also delve into the importance of access to land data and information. By empowering communities with data, we can foster transparency, accountability, and informed decision-making. This webinar will explore how to design land administration systems that generate and disseminate data in ways that are meaningful and accessible to all. So I'm excited to hear from our panelists as they will share their insights and experience on this critical topic. But before I will introduce them to you, there are a few additional logistical notes uh, before we begin. So this webinar is being streamed live on multiple platforms. Please note that live tweeting and promotion on LinkedIn is happening for this event from the Land Portal accounts and the hashtag we are using is hashtag Land at Skill. We have created a social media kit for this event, which has been shared with you in the chat. If you have questions, please post them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to answer them later on in the webinar. Finally, in the interest of transparency, I should add that today's session is being recorded and you will receive the link to the video afterwards. Also an article with the key messages will be available later in Land Portal's website. Now, the last reminder for our speakers as we have translation, please, I would like to remind you to speak slowly. Now, I'm very happy to introduce to you our panel of today. So first we have Niso Kaukamla, and he is the Land at Scale Project Coordinator for Oxfam in Chad. Niso is an expert in natural resource crisis and conflict management, and he's also a quality and accountability specialist. Then we have Royal Mabakeng, and she's a lecturer in land administration at Namibia University of Science and Technology. She's pursuing a PhD in spatial sciences. Her research focuses on land tenure and water access in informal settlements. Then we have Maria Clara van der Hammen. She is the Land at Scale Project Coordinator for Tropenbos, Colombia. She's an anthropologist with a PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of Utrecht with experience in participatory research with indigenous, peasant, and black communities. Last but not least, we have Charles Tom Bayer, who I will call Tommy, and he is the Senior Land Information Specialist for the Land Portal. He's a specialist in land governance and administration with a background in land surveying and information system design. And as you will see, he is an open data advocate. So I will start now with the first round. So please, let me give the floor to Royal to give us a five minute overview of what fit for purpose land administration is. What are we talking about Royal? All right, uh, thank you MK, just to start off. So when we think about a fit for purpose land administration, it's a top down land administration approach that focuses on creating partnerships firstly, developing capacity, of land institutions to improve land tenure at scale. I'll just quickly go into a general background in terms of how it came about. 
Uh, the approach emerged out of a gradual development of uh, land administration as a field of practice. Generally, land administration was fixed in cadastral and land registration systems, which were mostly developed for providing information about types of land use, land value, and land ownership. So the design was based on the cultures and judicial systems across the world. So decades ago, what happened is that they emerged uh, a new term where we defined now land administration as a process of determining, recording, and disseminating information about ownership, value, and use of land when implementing land management policies. So here you see again that the focus was still on information. So this was followed up by a change in requirements in the types of information or data that is collected on land. And this established land administration as a system. So when we talk about land administration as a system, it looks at in, uh, the creation of enabling infrastructure for implementing land policies and land management strategies in promoting sustainable development. And this is what we mostly also focus on uh, within our land uh, administration teaching at the university. And I believe many of the land institutions do also uh, look at land administration systems as an enabling infrastructure. So what we see over time, um, developed countries improved uh, their land institutions to enable the protection of, of land tenure um, and the relationships that people have to land. But what we have noticed is that um, this improvement in maturity of land institutions did not happen across the world. We see that uh, some countries still had uh, weak land governance and a high level of tenure insecurity. So with the advancements of technology and also the drive towards achieving uh, sustainable development, they emerged the development of what we call land tools. So these land tools have been spearheaded uh, by the Global Land Tool Network, uh, which uh, the University of Namibia University of Science and Technology is a partner, and I believe Land Portal as well, where, for example, some of the tools that were, that were developed is the social tenure domain model, which is both a theory and a concept that looks at recognizing the social tenure relationships that people have uh, to land, and then also a software application that supports uh, low income or local authorities that don't have any other types of technology to capture and record land rights. And then there is also the continuum of land rights, which has been piloted across different contexts. So now here we come to the development of the fit for purpose land administration, which is that this top uh, down approach. Firstly, it focuses on three fundamental frameworks where you have the, the spatial framework uh, that focuses on the use of aerial imagery. Uh, you have participatory field adjudication, and then you have the in incremental improvement of accuracy when you are collecting uh, your spatial information. And that is now supported or should be supported by uh, an institutional framework that should be holistic, transparent, and should also be cost effective. Uh, and there should be continuous uh, capacity development for the institutions that are implementing the land administration processes. And then lastly, there should be a legal framework uh, established uh, where fit for purpose land administration is enshrined in law, uh, promoting the security of, of land rights for all, uh, recognition of human rights, and then also gender equality. So just lastly, before I finish, I'd emphasize that the fit for purpose land administration approach has seven characteristics. So if you're implementing a fit for purpose land administration and you are missing some of this, uh, characteristics, there will be some questions whether your approach is fit for purpose or not. And so this seven are firstly, the approach should be flexible, where uh, your spatial data capturing should have some flexible approaches in it. The approach should be inclusive, um, where you ensure that you cater to all types of tenure, where you don't just sort of focus on your freehold, or you say you're only going to focus on your customary, it should recognize all types of tenure, including informal as well. It should be inclusive. As I mentioned, it should be participatory and it should be affordable. I'll emphasize affordability here because sometimes you develop a system and then it ends up being uh, too expensive or unaffordable. It should be affordable for the government institution uh, to implement and then also for the society 
uh, to use at the end. And then it should be reliable, uh, it should be attainable, in meaning that when you are implementing your fit for purpose uh, land administration, it shouldn't be an end in all. You should look at improving your accuracy and your standards over time. Um, and I just want to emphasize something that uh, Prof. Enemark, one of the uh, proponents of fit for purpose land administration, he emphasizes this the saying all the time, which is when you are implementing a fit for purpose land administration process, you should ensure that you do as little as possible and as much as necessary to ensure tenure security for uh, MK. That's all I, I had to cover in terms of the context. Thank you. Thank you, Royal. Um, I see that many people have joined the chat and I saw one name uh, out there as well from Stig Enema. He's one of the founders of Fit for Purpose. So welcome to all of you. Um, and we are very keen to also know uh, what your feedback is after the session. But thank you, Royal, for this excellent overview. Uh, so Fit for Purpose Land Administration is developed to address the immediate needs of a population for land rights security, and it should allow room for further development. Um, let me now bring in Maria Clara. Maria, how can we ensure that Fit for Purpose Land Administration also truly serves the needs of and priorities of local communities? Over to you. Okay, thank you, Imke, and thank you, Royal, for your very uh, excellent introduction to this whole issue. Um, well, I'm talking from Colombia, and in Colombia, uh, land and, and all the issues about land are are the fuel, are the, the reason, are the uh, uh, of the, our very long uh, lasting conflict in the country. We have very complicated situations where uh, and a very weak uh, land administration system. So a, a, a fit for purpose land administration system is very, very useful in this context. Um, and we have been uh, working with uh, indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities. Um, and what we have seen is that it's very important to uh, start a very participatory process. So uh, it's very important in this uh, process that people receive all the information uh, about land administration, about what kind of data um, are proposed to to collect what 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 is this all about what what are we going to uh, what are we talking about and what what could be of benefit for them so this uh, capacity building this information uh, exchange of information and trying to to deal with this has had been very important we, for instance we have been working with the uh, the Arawakan people of the Sierra Nevada and they have been buying informally a lot of pieces of land that they want to convert into a collective property type, which is a possibility for indigenous communities in Colombia. Uh, but then this information about the status of these pieces of land is, is very bad. They don't have access to it. We have been trying to work together with them to get a, a clearness uh, and uh, insight in this situation. Uh, so accompanying them also in this process of interacting with uh, state uh, state institutions has been also important. So, well, these are some first ideas about what 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 is needed. So this capacity building and then trying to understand also really what people uh, want and uh, what data are important for. Uh, if you allow me just uh, uh, half a minute, I think it was very interesting to see that for them, land governance and land administration is not only uh, something uh, like uh, about commodities or about economic issues, but it has also a very important spiritual dimension. And for them to have uh, information uh, and to to make it clear that their territory is has this dimension, this spiritual dimension, that there are a lot of sacred sites, um, is very important. So they want also to map the this in, this information as part of their land administration and land governance system, which makes it a very interesting dialogue with uh, the state institutions to introduce this kind of needs of the communities. Thank you, Ingmarke. Thank you, Maria Clara, and uh, very clear how you 
showcase the importance of meaningful consultation. So to uh, provide support in, in giving the right knowledge, but also to listen and understand what they need. Um, Niso, I would like to ask the same question to you. So what strategies can be employed to meaningfully involve marginalized groups in land administration processes? Over to you, Niso. Thank you very much, Imke. I think that first of all, we need to understand that any uh, land administration or any ad land policy that doesn't include the priorities of communities or doesn't take into account the socioeconomical um, realities of communities cannot um, be anything but an administration that serves the interests of other people um, who generally um, try and do land grabbing or are prone to land encroachment for their own benefit. So here, I think we need to run participatory analyses of needs for the community, the communities that would be impacted by reforms especially, and these need to be implicated, involved in land administration. Beyond evaluation of needs and needs assessment, I think we need to strengthen capacity in uh, policy making, they need to be present when we're deciding on new policies. Um, we cannot create policies that will impact communities without the communities being present. So that's why we need to strengthen their capacities so that they can be ready to participate in creating these policies. We need to prepare them um, for, so that they, as a community, are able to make that push, come up with a proposal and participate. We also need to discuss um, and create partnerships with these communities, help these communities in contributing, sharing their experience, because whatever happens, even if administration has, land administration has novelties to suggest, communities themselves for multiple hundreds of years manage to have their own land administration on a community basis. So I think that's why any entity that is considering to um, start with any kind of land administration reform must uh, engage the communities, especially marginalized populations, so that they participate in the creation of policies. Thank you, Emke. Sorry, it was hard to find the mute button, but here I am. Thank you very much, Niso, for uh, your intervention. And um, yeah, you clearly talk about empowering communities to stand up for themselves and to, to be part of the decision-making processes as well. Um, then I would like to go to Tommy. Uh, in your view, how can we ensure that fit for purpose land administration truly serves the needs and priorities of local communities? Hi, hi. Thank you, um, Imke, and thank you, everybody, um, for being at this webinar. I think I want to link up a little bit with what Clara has said, and also based on the introduction to Fit for Purpose from, from Royal. And she alluded to the sort of top-down approach and a point that has been contrasted by Maria Clara. And I would like to follow up on that. And, and she says that local communities should not only be the instruments in the application of technology, but also propose their needs and that... Um, Fit for Purpose should not only serve the needs of the state, but also the needs of the communities with regards to land administration services. And I think this ties in um, with, with a broader understanding that if Fit for Purpose land administration is to become a tool for improved land governance, it must continue that attempt to move land administration beyond an accounting of land rights for the purposes of the state, but also to be about the provision of services to communities um, about land and be in service to the community. So I think we then reach a point where land administration is less a system of accounting, which is of course an important component, but it also becomes a mechanism for providing services to communities about land. And I think this ties into a broader, I think, understanding of the role of the state in making fit for purpose work and having sort of deliberate government policy that allows that. 
So if we want to provide services and, and use technology and use fit for purpose in a way that empowers the rural poor, FFPLA projects must have a perspective that views data and information not only as an output from the system, but as a core input into the system. And, and I say an input, in other words, whose rights are being recorded, for what purpose are they being recorded, and how that system works. And so that input component from communities is essential to making fit for purpose work for everyone. But more than any other approach, I think fit for purpose is geared towards making provision for participatory approaches, but that only means that it is a possibility. It is not a guarantee. It is not a sure thing. So fit for purpose makes and opens more than other systems that possibility, but to ensure that this actually becomes the reality, detailed strategies are needed that prioritize local data ownership and accessibility, and that prioritizes active participation by the community, in the land administration and adjudication processes. And so that we see data and information about land becoming both a foundation for the land administration system input and output, but also becomes a key to ensuring that equitable services and the needed services are provided to communities at local level. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you for um, bringing data on board and um, helping us understanding and navigating through this uh, often very abstract concept. Um, before we move to the, to the next round, uh, we have a question uh, for Niso. Um, so the Fit for Purpose Land Administration is seen as a very top-down approach, but then how can it be done in such a way that it is truly participatory? Are those two conflicting each other? Or what is your view? So I think that uh, the only way to manage the uh, land tenure is to make sure that uh, we have a participatory approach. Uh, the land owners, they are the communities, we have the technical service from the state. They, they are taking in charge the land administration. That is why in both cases, the state should work uh, with the involvement and, and active participation on the part of the communities that they are the owner of those lands. Because before the authority of the state, we have the communities that own those lands. But with the public administration, we had to put in place a system of administration. So both should work hand in glove. And we try, when we try to isolate or put the communities aside and put forward at the, 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 the state, we will have conflict. So it is important that we have in our mind that we should implement a participatory approach. So access to information should, should be provided to the communities. They are the owners of the lands. And we have to build the capacities of this community for them to assert themselves when the, uh, the land tenure is in danger. We also have to implement uh, participatory police policies and policies that take into account the type of social economic activities of the communities. So we cannot have a land administration that does not take into account the types of activities that are carried out by the communities. So the, any uh, mechanism for land administration should take into account the social and cultural activities that are carried out by the uh, communities or indigenous communities. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for responding to the question, Niso. Uh, very clear. Then I would like to go to Royal. Um, the question to you is what strategies can be employed to meaningfully involve marginalized groups in led administration processes? And before you answer the question, could you maybe then also take into the account the following question uh, from the audience? Uh, what is the best way, or from your experience, to disseminate information to communities? Thank you. Over to you. 
All right, no, thank you, MK. Um, before I get into the answer and then also just uh, reflecting on, on Niso's uh, answer as well, uh, I just want to emphasize that when we are saying a top-down approach, we, we don't mean that a government institution would have uh, to implement what they want for the community. Uh, it has to be a partnership approach. I think what one of the essential elements of fit for purpose land administration is the creation of partnerships and developing of capacity. So it has to be both the, the top and the bottom working together in order to achieve uh, security of tenure for all. So participation is possible. And as Nisa also mentioned, um, having a needs assessment understanding what is it that the community wants and desires uh, in terms of how they want to see their land rights secured will be very essential. Um, in answering your question in terms of the best approach uh, to disseminate information to communities, uh, I would like to reflect back on, on how we are doing it here in, in Namibia. Uh, I think that one of the best approaches to start working with institutions or civil society organizations that are already having uh, these links within the communities. So they are most of the time the best ones because they know what are the best methods that needs to be to be um, used uh, to disseminate information. And the second one is also to start um, creating better relationships between the government and in communities. Sometimes uh, governments are viewed from a distance and communities from a distance as well. We need to bring communities and government closer together. Uh, in answering specifically your your question in terms of what strategies can be in, in, employed to meaningfully involve uh, marginalized groups. Uh, firstly, I would emphasize this over and over again. Uh, capacity development is important. Um, as uh, Maria uh, Clara already also uh, mentioned, uh, communities know and understand what it is that they need, right? Uh, communities know how their land lives can be secured. So when you are implementing a new approach, it is important that you train and capacitate the communities so that they can also contribute meaningfully. And the second one, which is also very important, I mean, everything is important, but this one is very, very important. There needs to be enabling and inclusive policies for participation. Uh, it needs to be prescribed in legislation that communities are supposed to be involved within this land administration process. And that uh, prescription within the, the law should also be followed up by monitoring and evaluation, ensuring that government agencies are actually doing what they say they're doing in terms of including communities in recognizing and securing of land rights. Thank you, MK. Thank you, Royal. And thank you for clarifying um, the top-down approach. and somehow to frame it as a partnership approach, what that's what's really needed. Um, and yes, everything is important. And talking about importance, uh, Niso, I'll get back to you because uh, one of the, well, one very important issue for, for Oxfam at least, you know, is gender equality. Could you, from your experience, share how gender equality and social inclusion are integrated in appropriate land administration? So yes, thank you for giving me the floor and for asking this question. We are in a process in charge. We are drafting a land policy. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the only policy uh, that has uh, witnessed the active participation of uh, the social, uh, the civil societies. So with all these stakeholders taking part in the process, it will enable us or it will enable each entity to feel involved and recognized in the, with this participatory approach, depending on the, the various backgrounds. So we have to carry out a diagnosis, uh, uh, gender analysis and uh, uh, social inclusion. So how can we go about it? It will enable uh, it will make sure that land administration will not marginalize communities and leave behind the communities. People should know their rights. We also have uh, this uh, obligation, this duty to take into account gender analysis and social inclusion. We, each institution 
should put in place a lab administration that takes into account gender analysis and social inclusion. Have we taken into account the, the participation of youth, women, uh, uh, disabled pers uh, people, uh, every people involved in gender should be consulted, but their view should be consulted for us to enrich our land policy and set up uh, vibrant and dynamic land policies. And after assessing the needs, after carrying out uh, gender analysis, we should build their capacities in terms of uh, advocacy for those people to be able to assert themselves, to defend their interests when we set up a, a public policy. We don't just have to carry out a study and ask people to participate in the, the, the process when they, they, they are not endowed with uh, uh, what it needs to carry out that kind of activity. So we have to support them in terms of advocacy, influence for them to own the, the mechanism and for them to influence the, the, the drafting process of the policy. So above all, we should sensitize and raise the awareness of uh, every uh, part of the society. Thank you very much, every segment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Niso. Thank you for uh, sharing your experience. And I think you make a very valid point that we should not generalize at all. And also, often in these uh, contexts, we talk about women in general, but also there are like so many different layers, so many different needs. So it's very important to carry out these assessments um, and also not generalize a group. Um, another very important topic, um, Maria Clara, over to you, is about environmental management. So how important is fit for purpose land administration for environmental management? Um, well, I think that environmental management and the environmental issues are very important and whatever we do, we always have to take them into account. I think more and more it's clear that climate change uh, is very important and that we cannot think about, uh, about land administration and land uh, governance without taking into account something that we call in the Colombian institution the ecolog ecological function of, of land ownership. So there is an ecological function uh, that you have to assure, uh, even if you if you have the right on the land, you, you have to assure that you, uh, you also uh, have a, a good uh, environmental management. There's something very interesting. We have been uh, working with collective properties and uh, in Colombia, but I think it's it's something that has been proven for the whole world. Uh, collective property uh, is a, a, like an assurance for good land management, for good environmental management. We can see land cover, uh, the most important areas with land cover are the, those areas that are managed by indigenous communities and well in Colombia also by the Afro-Colombian communities. Uh, that means that they have a system that that, that really works good with uh, uh, with the environment. They maintain biodiversity. They maintain, and that's because of their uh, use systems also. And to map and to and to uh, collect data about how they are using the land by themselves, uh, uh, how they use this this land is very important to bring into discussions. We have seen in the context text we have been working that there are a lot of conflicts between indigenous people or Afro-Colombian people and their neighbors and mostly these are conflicts about about uh, access to resources um, the conflicts around uh, around illegal mining illegal timber extraction illegal uh, well, contamination of, of watersheds um, so bringing in all this information into a dialogue, a local dialogue, has been very important to 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 construct like a, like a land governance system in which people can come uh, to agreements and environmental issues are common issues, common uh, preoccupations, worries, 
common worries in, in which it, it makes possible it is possible to get at, at, at local solutions based on this information which is so important um i think really we have to, to find more and more ways in uh, in which to involve these environmental issues in, into land administration uh, also i don't know if yes. i've answered your question <laughs> thank you Marie -Claire. yes you did um and i think one of the key factors in facilitating this is the role of data and Tommy, you are a, a data advocate. Could you uh, share your experience on what are the barriers for accessing land data and information? Also how these could be overcome. And the third question to add into the mix is who owns the data? That's a question from the audience. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, thank you very much. And maybe just very quickly to, express my appreciation for making this link between these sort of environmental issues and the role of land administration and land administration information um, as, as a sort of baseline for addressing environmental issues. So I, I just want to emphasize that it's an important point. Imke, this is a big ask, but I want to, I want to separate out issues that are outside or at least in my humble opinion, a little bit outside of the scope of FF um, PLA and those are that within the scope that, that one can address. So, so the issues that are sort of bigger and broader are general issues such as access to technology, um, Wi-Fi penetration in countries and in rural areas, uh, broadly information and communication access technologies, you know, um, internet connectivity, digital literacy. So, so these are national and global issues that we need to address, but that are often not within the scope of a fit for purpose land administration project. Not to say that they are not important or they must not be considered, but I think it's worth giving that kind of separation of the issues. Then within the FFPLA, um, even there, sometimes technology can be a bit of a, a red herring because it really depends on the purpose for which the technology is employed and, and the barriers that we see there. So if you look at the founding documents for Fit for Purpose, it says that closed data, closed information, closed dialogue are barriers to implementing FFPLA. So simply put, a lack of transparency. There's a lot in the way of tools that enable openness, but how do we choose to employ these tools um, that, that is, is, is a conscious decision that we need to make. So one of the way of, I guess, um, then also so overcoming the barrier is to make data more open. Offer government data in more useful formats that is machine readable, that is downloadable, that is time timely, that makes it interoperable and reusable. Also preemptively and proactively release information publish information, and I'm not talking about data, and I'm talking about information. Um, this could be information on government activities, on development budgets, on spending priorities, on tracking land data applications, and how these processes are managed. Because that opens the gate to dialogue and gives citizens a stronger say in government policies and priorities, and further reinforces this positive engagement. And another barrier is the lack of using defined standards. And, and I would argue the uh, FFPLA can also take the lead there in advocating for, for common standards. Uh, I, I saw in the chat, somebody mentioned LADM. You know, so, so using these sort of consistent frameworks and standards is a way of overcoming these barriers of data that cannot speak to each other. I think another barrier is the lack of local knowledge in, in, in mapping processes, because that reduces the likelihood of acknowledging local land rights on land. So when we use our tablets and, and GIS software that is open and open source, it relies on using and engaging um, the communities. I think there's examples from the Shack Dwellers Federation of Namibia and the Community Land Information Program because the data itself can become an instrument that shifts political power or entrenches political power. And so when we think of communities, we can talk about um, making things more equ equitable or entrenching existing inequities. And then the last point I want to make is 
a, a lack of data rights and a lack of data um, privacy pr protections. These are both technical and legal issues that we can deal with because open data is not without limits. So I think when we start thinking about protecting sensitive information, but we think about publishing that which is necessary, we are aware of conflict and sensitive contexts that local realities exist in. And that should drive kind of the data policy rather than sort of an overarching narrative, but really connect to those local realities so that you have a land administration system that is responsive. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. So um, as, as we already discussed also before, data uh, can become its own reality, depending on who's using what data uh, and for what purpose. So there's a lot of strength and empowerment, but as you said, it can also uh, create more inequality, so to say. Um, Sorry, Imke, you also asked the last question about, you yes. know, whose data and, and for what, and, and maybe if I can just have 30 seconds. Please do. I, I think this is why I try to emphasize that kind of local participation and local reality, because that question cannot be answered without involving the people that we are talking about. So I cannot say, you know, what should be the purpose of the data other than in the broadest context to provide land administration services, but local people when they're involved in those conversations, can then engage in the conversation about what the data can be used for, should be used for to enable what service. And, and I think when we have time at the end, I would like to talk about um, the experience in Namibia with the Shag Dwellers Federation and the Community Land Information Program, because I think it's a good illustration of how data can shift the narrative of the conversation. Thank you, Tommy. I think we should reserve some time at the end for this example. Um, and people in the chat are also referring to political will. So you mentioned often we can do this and we could do that, but could you maybe share something on your opinion about political will? How can it um, help with fit for purpose administration and data? Um, or what are the barriers you would say? Well, I, I, I said, earlier that fit for purpose land administration um, provides you a, a shell for doing something, but it is not a guarantee of, of that outcome. And so when we think about data from or, or fit for purpose, uh, there are some technical things that can be done, but those things need to be enabled in law. And in law, we need to be able to say, um, Land governance is fundamentally about a democratic contestation of rights between the state and civil society, the public. And so you need to have a land administration system where the state is willing to allow that contestation to take place so that people can react to the data and say, no, this land being registered as state land or as whatever the category may be does not resonate with us. So you must build a system. And that depends, of course, on the, the sort of political scenario, creating the space for that dialogue, for that ability to say, no, no, this data contradicts our local knowledge and have mechanisms with which to deal that. If the purpose of a land administration system is to justify pre-existing power dynamics, pre-existing land relationships, pre-existing inequities, then it does not change the underlying reality on the ground. So from that perspective, I think political will, while it's not the only driver and there are other ways of generating political will or contesting political will, but in the broader sense, it is needed and it needs to be a fundamental part of these type of projects, whether they're at national level or whether they're at local level. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, Royal, I would like to go uh, to you um, on the same topic. So. On the one hand, how uh, what are the barriers to accessing land data and information? How could these be overcome? Um, but also the role of political will um, in, in getting this data. And there maybe you can also address one of the questions of the audience, namely, and talking about data, what data will be registered? Because there might be communities who want to register community land. There might be individuals who want to 
register individual land. So what does fit for purpose do and what data will be generated? Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, MK. Um, I think the conversation is getting more interesting by the minute. Um, I think one of the things that we should also realize um, when we're asking about what data, what should be registered and who will be part of the process, we should look at the part of fit for purpose land administration that focuses on purpose. So whatever data is going to be collected is based on the purpose that is decided between the community and the government. So if the purpose is to protect the environment, that will be the type of data that would inform that purpose. If the purpose is basically to secure tenure for all, recognizing the rights of women, children, vulnerable people, people living with disabilities, pensioners, for example, as well, then that will be the data that will be collected to inform that land registry or that land recordation process. So what we also should realize with fit for purpose land administration is that this is not what we say, what we do in Namibia is what can be done in Chad. What can be done in Chad should be done in Malawi or should be done in um, uh, Colombia. No, no, this is about countries and communities defining what their purpose is. Um, getting back to your question uh, in terms of um, what are some of the barriers uh, with regard to um, accessing land data? And I'm, I'm, I will be speaking from from my own experience and also some of the um, experiences that I've identified within literature. So what we see is that there are three main barriers to accessing land data, um, mainly technology, technological challenges, uh, political challenges, and then also just some systematic issues that are there because of how systems have been designed and developed. So the first one, um, you know, navigating governmental processes is quite a challenge. Uh, when you need to get approval to access data, it can take weeks sometimes, uh, especially within the Namibian context. When you want to access data, let's say from the Ministry of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform on communal land um, parcels, that are communal land rights, you need to write a, a letter to the executive director. That executive director needs to give it to the director that is responsible for that division before it gets to the person that actually works with the data. So these procedures are quite lengthy at times and they're also confusing. So it sometimes makes it very difficult to access data in time. And then the second one, um, sometimes the data is not decentral, is not centralized. The data is decentralized. One specific example that I have is we were doing a research project on understanding community agricultural projects in Namibia. Instead of getting the data directly from the central government, we were directed to go to the regions in order to access the data. But then when we get to a regional level uh, request, that request was sent back so that we can get permission from the national uh, directorate for us, for the region to release that data. So this makes it very, very difficult. And then in instances where you have, for example, in Namibia, we have the national spatial data infrastructure where it's supposed to be a harmonization of all different types of land related data um, available in one place. You can uh, look it up online. This data is always not up to date. So that also is another challenge. When there is access, uh, the data is always not, at times, not up to date. And then there's also the technological gaps that may exist. Um, as much as there's advancement in some parts of the world, in other parts, there's also limitation of um, of internet coverage and on also access to, to, to internet. In urban areas, it can be a cost issue. And then in rural areas, it can just be the availability of networks. So this also makes it very difficult uh, to access land data. And then uh, I think lastly, the other barrier that, that is also you know, connected to some of the other aspects that uh, Tommy was referring to is, is the lack of clear policies and, and, and uh, around access to information and land data. So there's always this um, confusion around what is data privacy, what is data security. Because of this confusion and a lack of clear policies, it sometimes limits government agencies or creates hesitations from government agencies from sharing land data. And this has, in a way, also leads to um, you know, a delay in, in, in finishing projects. It can also delay planning. And at times, sometimes it actually has an impact on the cost of projects because instead of you accessing data that is already available, you end up collecting the data again and spending a lot of uh, money on that. 
uh, Clara, that's, that's what I had to share regarding some of the barriers uh, to accessing land data. I meant MK, thank you. Yes, thank you, Royal. Thank you also for reminding us that we're not only talking about whose purpose, but also what purpose. Mm -hmm. That's also very important in this approach. Um, I would like to go back to NISO. So NISO, we've heard already a lot about the obstacles on accessing land data and information. Uh, from your experience, how can they be overcome? And in addition, a question from the audience on how can data shape policies that truly serve the needs of communities? I'm sure you can share something from your experience on that. Thank you very much, Imke. So to come to access to data and information, we need to have existing data. We are in a country where there are no land policies. And if we don't have these, then there isn't any data. We have a country who uses regulatory texts from the 50s, the 60s, uh, texts that really do not meet the needs, the economic needs of the country, of the communities. The communities don't recognize themselves in these texts. So first of all, I think we need to position ourselves and and i think the other panelists mentioned access to data because maybe in their countries there is a system for collecting such data and access is the problem but in my country to have access to data we would need to have data that actually exists so we need to first uh, accomplish the, te the, the the step of collecting data before even having the issue of accessing it we are doing so with rudimentary techniques. Uh, it is nothing to do with recent technologies. Another difficulty we are facing in our country and in the process, the ongoing process, is that there is a lack of coordination. There's a lack of coordination in the data collection, in management of data, uh, land data. And this lack of coordination means that all the people who need to have access to data need to spend a lot of money. So again, we've got the costs issue. There are issues related to the complexities of the processes and administration itself. So all these elements combined mean that be it research institutions, organizations, international organizations, associations, they want to have access to data. Even communities want to have access to data that don't exist. So I don't know exactly, you know, um, how many, uh, how much data we do have, but the country isn't really mapped. So we don't have enough data. So in terms of comparing to other countries, I don't think we have enough data available to even have an issue with accessing it. Our students who are doing research in land and land administration sometimes need to go on site to collect data themselves. And this isn't certified data. So there, these are really complicated and deep issues that we cannot solve within the year or within a couple of years because access to technology is also a problem. We're struggling with collecting da land data and there's also the problem with corruption sometimes related to data collection and um, access to land information. So that's that's my experience and how I can answer your question. Um, I can't remember the second part of your question, if you could remind me, please. Yes, thank you, Niso. So I hear that there is uh, a lack of data. That's the first uh, problem. Um, and my question was also, also uh, to refer back to the audience in um, how do communities receive land registration programs or projects, for example? So um, from individual titling versus community titling, do communities, are they, for example, afraid that they might lose their tribal relations or, or the communal sense? That's, um, what is your experience? Because you're really starting with, with getting tenure security for local communities or individuals. So first of all, in rural communities, some communities don't eat, don't even try because the cost is too high and it takes them too much time. So communities don't even try to secure their land. Then there's maybe the, like getting this land tenure, but there are mechanisms that manage land or allow to manage land. But 
it, it, you know, they don't really know exactly where the limits are. They do their best at the community level to find mechanisms to manage all of this. But if we ask them to secure their land by trying to get um, land documents, land registries, they don't even try. They don't want to. It takes them too much time. Um, it costs too much. And uh, then the government might even say that it's not a community land, it's state land. So I, I agree with um, what everyone else has said about technology, using technologies that could streamline and, and make everything easier, but we would need access to technology. I think it could simplify processes, reduce costs uh, for data collection, land data information and information and access. I think that could probably improve coordination for all data collection um, in in land in the country. But in this era, we know that updating activities would also be easier with technology. No matter the availability or the localization of someone, they could have access to the data if they were available online. So if we had a fit for purpose technological system, then we could also uh, have better access. But in any case, in our situation, there are difficulties for um, our communities to have access to land data and information. Thank you, Niso. Thank you for sharing the many challenges that you are facing in chat. Uh, you already bridged two technologies. And um, Tommy, could you maybe share also listening to Niso, how can technology be leveraged to improve data accessibility and sustainability and usability? Well, I, I was listening to 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 Niso, and I was um, I, I was thinking about how much data surrounds us at at the moment. Um, so I think we can map the world easily. The technology is not the problem from that regard. It's that we cannot assign the rights, manage the development, and fairly allocate those resources accurately. So if you look at cloud services, tablet computing, cell phone technology, satellite internet, um, Google Earth, and the world is, is mapped and anybody in the world can access more information that they can use. We can easily scan hand-drawn maps and vectorize them. It only tells us and gives us a picture of the Earth. It doesn't assign the rights. We don't know who is the owner or the renter or the occupier of that parcel. And I think that's where the, the challenge comes in when it comes to sort of equity, but also when we think of technology. I think that the technology to collect the data is there and often the data has been collected. It's the, the designation of who is the beneficiary, who has the right to use. That becomes difficult because you can't see that from Google Earth. You can see the building, you can see it's a field, but you don't know who is the owner. You don't know who is legally entitled to receive the benefits from that. And that's really, I think, where we have a, a problem. And that brings in this question, I think at one point you asked Imka, for whose benefit and for what purpose? So when we do this mapping, and there's a lot of private initiatives that are mapping, there's global organizations that are mapping the world as we speak, and it's been done and it's ongoing and in more detail. But how can we make that work for society in a way that is more equitable? Because the inequity is what we are trying to address when it comes to um, land registration and tenure and fit for purpose. And here, I think we, we have to get better at national level. Countries have to get better um, to link up with and, and leverage continental initiatives. You know, Africa has a digital transformation strategy for Africa 2020 to 2030 and kind of try and situate these initiatives within, I think, broader national and continental frameworks. Because the African Union already, we, we talked about political will. The African Union provides that legal um, legitimacy coming from the continental level. And many of the countries have signed up. So the heads of states are in some sense committed. And so that is a strategy for leveraging and getting that political will and, and buy in. At the same time, there are also continental strategies um, for legal initiatives about ensuring more equity when it comes to, to land. So I think to overcome the sort of technological resistance in some ways, um, the barriers to information, 
It's about moving to making sure that information and the way it is used actually makes people's lives better, provides improvements on the ground. It's not just about um, theoretically, this is what can be done. The question is actually, does that bring water to my house? Does it provide sanitation services? Does that secure my rights? Does it mean I won't be relocated or disenfranchised or um, moved off my land or persecuted? And I think we need to get better at making those links. And so when it comes to sort of improve the accessibility of data and the usability of data, I think we need to get much more um, regular in conducting data audits, data feedback loops, where we see data as really a core part of these processes and develop feedback mechanisms where the communities can object, can raise. And it brings me back to my earlier point about this democratic contestation of rights. That means we need to have a land administration system that is willing to accept changes in the land record in order to improve the scenario rather than striving for perfection from the beginning. And I think Royal mentioned at one point, she said, you know, the purpose part, the fit for purpose, you need to consider where country is, where that community is, and how you can best deliver on, on these promises that are promises from the fit for purpose. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, it's very clear. Um, so maybe Maria, you could share from your experience in Colombia, working with the communities, um, how can technology be leveraged to improve data accessibility and usability? Hmm. Well, <laughs> Um, well, a lot of things have been said already, but I, I think that it's very important to 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 assure that 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 digital technology is really uh, accessible, simple, uh, easy to use, easy to use in in, in difficult situations. Many times, uh, uh, rural areas are difficult to access, or so having uh, cell phone applications, having to to collect data. Uh, sim simple ways in which uh, everybody, even if you are not literate, you can use the, those systems. And then I think also that there has to be uh, worked on, on on having a very um, available web post where the information can be can, can be uh, available. So these are things that that we, that we have seen. We have seen, for instance, in the same example I, I brought in. Uh, at the beginning about the indigenous people from the Sierra Nevada uh, who had made already their own handmade maps, uh, very detailed, beautiful maps with a lot of information in the where all these those plots that they want to to in, to uh, to have uh, as part of a collective land title are documented, but in a way in which it is not usable uh, by the uh, state institution. So. Using this 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 cell phone application and making maps that that, that look more technological and are uh, connected uh, in 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 a language in a technological language that can be used by the by the state uh, or uh, institutions, it, it, it's helped to to to, to accelerate uh, the process a bit. So I think. Uh, can be used as a, a translation, but I think that, that, that there are a lot of things and I, I, we have been talking a lot about uh, technology, uh, state and local communities, but there are also issues that are involving thing, international contexts and international uses of, 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 of technology that, that are imposed also to the countries and to the, and to the communities. Uh, we have been um, like suffering a bit <laughs> uh, the carbon credit uh, issue in in Colombia, and they they have all these uh, private companies that have been uh, contacting local communities that have these collective lands, which are very attractive because they have a good a good uh, land cover and and a lot of biomass. Uh, to sell in this uh, in this uh, carbon credit market, um, and there is not no information. There's no regulation. There's no regulation at international level. There's no regulation at national level, and then there is this 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 idea of of that you need a lot of very specialized technology to prove land coverage, etc. That so that people themselves cannot 
generate this information about uh, about carbon and how carbon uh, is captured in their territory. So it's very abstract. It's in a language that makes it very difficult. So um, you need these regulations. You need uh, uh, access to the information. We even don't have a clear information what kind of, 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 of agreements are established between all these on this private companies and local communities it's not clear for the for the the state itself or the government what's going on so uh, yeah generating a lot of information and creating this this web portals about this information and then i think we have also to think that it's not only a state and, and the community but this international context uh, context that's also important for for data information management Thank you, Maria Clara. And uh, one follow-up question. How do you support the communities uh, when they feel that they are imposed all these technologies and that they have to fit in, into that uh, mechanism, so to say? What, what do you do with them or how do you support them? Um, now, for instance, in this, this carbon credit uh, issue, the, import, the importance is, uh, that has been to, to, that they understand what, what it is about, uh, what what kind of information is collected, how we can translate it in a simple way, uh, so that they can that, that they can understand what, what what the issues are. I, I think that's one of the important things. So, so we go back to in, uh, capacity building, information, um, accessible information for the people in a language they can understand and then in which the, what they can do. Uh, and then there is a lot of of because of, 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 of this, this situation has given a lot of governance, internal governance problems, conflicts among leaders, conflicts between communities. Uh, uh, so talking and helping them to think about what kind of, of governance they need to, uh, to, to be able to, um, uh, to be able to uh, affront, uh, to, to assume these kind of, of new um, issues that are coming to them. Mm -hmm. and they're so related to, yeah. to land governance. Mm. Thank you, Maria Clara. Uh, Royal, I would like to get back to you. Um, lots have been said already. Could you share your experience from Namibia on uh, working with local communities, data accessibility and usability? Okay, thank you, MK, on data accessibility and usability. Now, one of the case studies, I think, which is also one of the best in the world is the case of the Shed Dwellers Federation of Namibia. Uh, it is an affiliate of Slum Dwellers International. Um, they have been working for the past 30 years in collecting data in informal settlements, uh, understanding what is the land tenure arrangement in the informal settlements, uh, what is the availability of services within the settlement and what are some of the environmental concerns that they have? So once they collect this data as community, they take the data and they present it to the local authority. But one thing that I have to emphasize is that before the community takes the data and present it to the local authority, they present it to themselves and then they have a dialogue and understand that, you know, what are the development priorities that we have in this area? And how can we contribute towards, you know, improving our own community and not necessarily just relying on government action? Uh, so once there's an agreement on community level, the data is presented to the local authority and the negotiation process starts happening. We have had successful case studies, one in, in Kobabas, which is in, 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 uh, in the regional capital of Omaheke region here in Namibia, where we have seen a community of about uh, 2,000 households. Uh, for some countries, it might be small, but for, for the Namibian context, it's quite big. Uh, managed to avoid land evictions and, and resettlement and maintained their rights within that informal settlement. We had assistance from uh, the Global Land Tool Network uh, in uh, piloting the social tenure domain model, where communities were trained on collecting the data themselves, capturing this data, and then also presenting and analyzing this data. And, and what we have seen is right now we have communities constructing their own houses. They have a security of tenure, where later on with the efforts that the communities have made and uh, the recognition from the local authority, we had national government come in and say, recognize them 
and provide access to formal land rights where they have now secu security of tenure through the implementation of the flexible land tenure system. And we are moving on with what we are learning from, from one small case study. We have another town where we are currently piloting our um, tenure responsive uh, land use planning, where local authorities should plan in order to respond to the tenure or the in insecurity of tenure of communities. So this has all come from communities deciding that they need to show the local authority and government in general that they have challenges and they presented this challenges with data. You know, they presented uh, the, the, the affordability levels in the community. They presented um, income levels as well, and also what their development priorities are. It was not just a matter of um, demonstrating that they are in they have a challenge. They also demonstrated that they have capacity. You know, they are able to contribute. And we have had quite a lot of support as well from some international development partners that provided funding. We have had uh, professional land surveyors that came up and provided assistance in, in, in boundary measuring. So this was all efforts from the community level and government came on board and provided uh, additional support as well. And I think this can be scaled up uh, on a national level. And I think countries can also take this, this example and see how they can apply it. But it all required all the different partners to come together and address the needs of the community. Thank you, Royal. Thank you for sharing these uh, ins these inspirations. And I think um, all documentation around these case studies that people can learn from, it would be great to have the link so that people can also look it up after this webinar um, and get inspired and, and learn. Um, and um, what I would like to um, also link this to Tommy, because um, you are an open data advocate, but of course, all these um, documents and, and all these learnings, uh, they are all displayed also on the land portal. And that's also a big data uh, platform um, where people can go to. So I would just encourage you to do so. Um, but then, Tommy, going back to more the local level, so to say, what role can civil society organizations play in advocating for open and accessible land data? Okay, um, very quickly, I think we must recognize that civil society um, and the relationship to government can occupy sort of different spaces. It can be antagonistic, it can be activist, it can be cooperative, you know, it can be collaborative. And so everybody has to figure out kind of the way that best works. But I think what it comes down to is about articulating a vision and defining how your needs can be met or should be met, what those needs are in a world that I think is increasingly disconnected physically and more connected digitally. And so one of the examples I want to come circle back to uh, is the Community Land Information Program in Namibia. And some years ago, when we were working on that, we had a community that essentially comprises about I think at that time, 140,000 um, households that were living in informal settlements and extensive information set about themselves that they had documented. And uh, we were at the university, were kind of uh, sort of um, a liaison with government. There was a lot of initiatives, a lot of discussions, but what happened every time is that politically government would say, yes, we will support, we will provide services. But when these processes now go to the technocrats in the Department of Urban Development. They work from the data that they have. This data of 140 families in informal settlements does not exist in the formal system. By definition, these people don't exist because the technocrats, the planners that are looking at water connections and new connections for sewer, how much energy will we need next year? That data does not get into the system. It is only when, after many exhaustive meetings taking several years, when that community could present the data to the ministry, could have some sort of grudging acknowledgement that the data exists and that this data becomes part of the formal government planning mechanism that they can actually start even being catered for. My point that I'm trying to make here is that these 140,000 families existed, but for the planners in paper, remotely in, in far removed public planning offices, they don't exist. So the data or the existence of the data becomes the act of existence 
for the community, for the people. And so that is just, I make that point to say that often communities and people underestimate the importance and the value of data. Because in this digital world that is disconnected, if you don't exist in the computer system, in the software, in the information system, then I am sorry you don't exist. You know, we've all had that kind of cartoon moment where you are standing in front of a computer receptionist or desk and they say, I'm sorry, sir. Um, according to my system, it says you have died. And you say, yeah, well, I'm, I'm here. It says, doesn't matter. My, my information in front of me, the system says you don't exist. And I think that's the dilemma. And I think that is what organizations like, you know, the Land Portal, the National Housing Action Group, the Shack Dwellers Federation, that is um, a, a thinking that we need to understand, that we need to internalize, that often our very existence is defined by our existence in a database or being accounted for in a database, at least when it comes to sort of the planning services, the provision of land services. It, it's a terrible thing to say, but it is a reality that I think we need to deal with. So if you ask what role can we play, it's to think about that and then think, how do you respond to that predicament or to, to that challenge as a civil society organization or as a community? Yes, and while you're talking, Tommy, I mean, I already sense this feeling of like to refrain from this because like everything is data nowadays, but like we just listened to NISO and there is no data on land for chat. So how, how do these realities, you know, how do they come together? Um, and um, I think it's a very important discussion to have also that many people are afraid of all these developments, you know, and which shoe you try to fit in, so to say. Um, sorry, you wanted to respond to that? I just wanted to say, I mean, yes, of course, I, I realize completely it raises sort of a, a, a broader, almost existential philosophical question. Um, how can I not exist when I am here, I'm on my land or I'm on my farm? Yet, just because I'm not in somebody else's database, I don't exist. But it does happen. What happens is a multinational corporation signs an agreement with the government and they will say, ah, this land is a forest reserve. There are no people. They don't exist because they're not in the database. There could be thousands of people living in that area, but your absence from any formal kind of database registry information system really sort of undermines also your physical existence. And this is a huge challenge. This is a huge problem for individuals and organizations uh, that they need to deal with where your physical reality is becoming less and less relevant to your digital reality. Yeah. Thank you, Tommy. Well, another way to approach it is by uh, proper due diligence processes by companies, but I think we can have a whole other webinar on that uh, topic. Uh, thank you uh, for your intervention. Um, I know that we only have like 10 minutes left, so um, I would like to go back to Maria Clara. We have heard a lot about land governance issues and um, for you, what are the key challenges and opportunities to integrate land governance consideration into fit for purpose land administration? Uh, well, <laughs> key, there is so many key things, but uh, um, I think that, that, that there is a, a key opportunity at, uh, involving local people. We have just finished a very interesting process of, of uh, free prior informed consent with indigenous uh, communities, uh, peoples uh, of the country, uh, because the country is trained to uh, uh, introduce a multi-purpose uh, cadastre system. And uh, as they have their rights, uh, the right for to a free uh, prior informed consent to see how they will be involved in this multi-purpose uh, um, cadastre system. Um, it has been very interesting because this whole process, uh, and, and, and then we have to take into account that one third of the country is in hands of, of indigenous communities who have a big, big uh, in, indigenous uh, resguardos reserves. Uh, so it's important to have their, their informed consent to manage the information, etc. 
that be very important because they, 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 they designed uh, like a protocol how to manage the data, who is going to collect the data. The communities themselves are uh, uh, made, it has been possible now through this protocol that they are the ones who are, are, are becoming uh, cadastral operators for their, uh, for their territories. Um, and uh, being part of the uh, co uh, the collection of information, but also information that can serve as a basis for their life plans and their uh, land governance plans. So I think it's it's a very interesting process to see that you through a political negotiation uh, based on, on on international supported rights, this this FPIG right. Uh, has been very important. So you see that it is a huge uh, opportunity to integrate these uh, land uh, governance uh, considerations. Uh, but then to, to, to bring it down to earth in, in concrete situations, I think that's a big, big challenge. And we have seen that that involving, for instance, uh, universities is 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 also is, is very important. So you you need you need the the whole society. For instance, in universities that can inform that can accompany uh, uh, specific communities in these processes um, is very important and help very helpful. Um, so I I think this these two things huh, that using this 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 formal political. Uh, instruments and then also uh, having the voluntary uh, support of, of, of other actors that can be very important to to because the the, the, the situations in Colombia each region is a whole different uh, constellation of, of of different populations in different situations with different rights uh, very complex different languages well uh, so we need a lot of people helping and thinking and and and, uh, and supporting local communities. Thank and you, Maria Clara. And uh, your plea on the additional support is also very clear and the context specificity, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's so true. Um, I would like to um, give the last question um, first a royal and maybe Niso can add because I think it's an interesting question from the audience. So first, also for you, what are the key challenges and opportunities in integrating land governance consideration into the fit for purpose land administration? But then also, um, how can fit for purpose land administration support Africa's transition uh, towards a decolonized land approach? So I hope Royal, you, you can take this question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, MK. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we, we have to recognize is that when we, especially when you're looking at the African agenda, uh, Agenda 2063, there is an approach that uh, is uh, presented in the text that does enable countries uh, to provide and secure tenure for all. Uh, and that moves means that countries should look at uh, changing and amending legislation colonial legislation in order to meet the needs of, of their communities. So basically, I would just uh, mention that uh, on, on that question. Um, getting back to the, the question around the opportunities for integrating uh, land governance considerations in fit for purpose, uh, I think they are there. Uh, they are integrated. They, there is a, a promotion of, of participation, inclusivity. Uh, there is a, a promotion of uh, transparency within land administration processes and within land administration institutions. And I believe that the opportunities uh, for implementing fit for purpose at scale and securing tenure for all lies in strengthening our collaboration. I, 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 I was so excited and very happy uh, when Mara Clara mentioned the role of universities. Universities are at the, at the core of, of, of the next generation of professionals that are going to support the implementation of it for purpose land administration. So I think governments should look at including and partnering with community, uh, with universities. And then I also would like to reflect this on what we have done here at the Namibia University of Science and Technology. We have been working with uh, civil society. We have uh, partnership agreements with national and local government in ensuring that we pilot and test some of these theories that are being presented in, in literature and some of the cases that have been done in other countries. We are piloting them actively 
here in, in Namibia. And I, and I think uh, when we move to uh, reflecting a bit more on the challenges, um, I just want to mention that some of the major challenges of fit for purpose land administration lies in our comfort zones as land professionals, where um, there is this requirement to maintain the status quo uh, of, of you know, surveying standards or your land valuation uh, standards. So I think we need to move away from this and just embrace uh, the fit for purpose approach a bit more. And while we do emphasize that there is tenure security for all, there is also a lack of investment, uh, at least serious investment in uh, land uh, uh, property or securing of tenure projects. There is, there is, there is not enough investment. I think governments need to start committing a bit more in terms of capital in, in supporting projects that are looking at securing land rights for all. Uh, and finally, maybe to, to, to repeat again, uh, in terms of the opportunities, firstly, I would say there is enabling uh, a legislation that promotes the inclusion of communities in recognition of their land rights, at least within the Namibian context. There are institutional frameworks that we can already take advantage of in seeing how do we apply the fit for purpose approach um, in capturing data and then also in managing land data. And, and there are so many institutions already that have been set up that have quite a lot of knowledge. I would mention the International Federation of Surveyors, for example, it runs various capacity development projects. There is a young surveyors network that look at capacitating the future uh, uh, land surveying professionals. So I think countries should take advantage of these resources that are available on an international level. I'm, I'm also quite excited when, I, when I'm hearing, I'm finishing now, when I'm hearing the case of NISO in chat that they, they don't have the data. And I'm like, okay, but we have the experience, we have the knowledge on how to collect that data. Um, we are quite open and available to provide that support. Maybe another country that is French speaking will be available that has uh, some good case studies. So I think we should leverage what is already there and see how we can uh, make improvements. Thank you, uh, MK. Thank you, Royal, and thank you for these also kind words and, and uh, providing a helping hand. So we have only two minutes left. So I would like to ask Niso, Maria Clara and Tommy to have a very short last remark for the audience. Niso. Thank you very much. For the last question that was uh, and that uh, Clara answered, I think there's uh, an issue that we should add. That is uh, dissemination of some data collection uh, methods. If we have instruments, laws to to manage land, but when we we draft these laws there's a problem of enforcement of implementation because uh, the, the, the community in favor of which we have to implement those laws, they generally they don't even know the, the content. They don't understand th those instruments. So setting up uh, these uh, uh, in Arabic or French communities, they can, they can speak those languages, but they don't master it. So so sometimes when we, we set up, when we, we draft these laws, we should take into account the fact that in our country, we didn't, before we launched this uh, uh, land policy, but we, we, we were able to bring about a change with the civil society organizations, with uh, the land policy in charge, uh, it is geared to. It is uh, supported by uh, the social, social, um, civil society organizations. So we, they, they were able to defend the rights uh, of the communities, and with their involvement, we know that we are going to move forward on those issues. So they are, they, they will be able to carry out this advocacy work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Niso. That's a very great example, and I think it should be shared with the audience as well, as you have uh, recorded this uh, and written it up. Um, Maria Clara, a final word. <laughs> I lost my time, my, my one minute, my one second. No, I think there is something that's 
very important, uh, which is symbolic and the power of symbolic action. Are, are, are so important in our context. I think many of the countries we are talking have a, a colonial past and a colonial a need to decolonize still, need to decolonize. And there is one thing which I, I think we have to put effort on it. And that is that we make maps and we include information with the local names of the sites of the, of the, of the country itself. So we have like, like a very... Uh, Spanish names for everything while people have their own names, their own. And I think this is something which they can do and they can do and they would like to do, they want to do, they want to show that they have this this knowledge, this way of uh, connecting to the land uh, as, as an empowering instrument. So I think this is something that should be part of, of, of land administration efforts, information efforts. Um, well, Thank you, Maria Clara. Very okay. clear practical point and I think that that should be taken on board uh, last Tommy thank you very much I'll be very quick two things I want to say one we need to stop I'm not saying we all think of it that way but fit for purposes is, is really not a project it's a land administration system it's an approach to land administration and land governance and I think that's an important point um, to take away from here and then my my second point uh, and this was posted by I think Pamela Duran in the chat at some point she asked a question about decolonization and I think we can also see um, how decolonization as a political tool or as a political project can use fit for purpose to have some honest conversations about how land is governed by whom for whose benefit and for what purpose? Because I see democratic land governance as a very natural contestation of the landless and rural poor and the state and government actors in, and this is going to go back and forth. Yes. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you to all the panelists uh, for your final words. And uh, please take the survey that has been shared by uh, Neil and um more um, will come. So please just watch out for Land Portal for the recording and uh, for the, the key takeaways. Thank you all. A big applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Emperor. Bye, everyone.